So Glenn, we haven't spoken in a little while because you've been creeping through some deep dark rainforest again. Where did you go this time? Yeah, well, I just got back last week from a couple weeks down in Brazil. We start that trip in the Atlantic rainforest. There's some really great birds there. When I hear Brazil, I always think of parrots. I know that's not your main target, but I'm sure you saw some at least. When we get into the Pantanal, there's probably one of the most spectacular parrots in the world, the hyacinth macaw, the biggest macaw, the biggest parrot in the world, just stunning, stunning bird. But we'll talk about him later. The first stop is in the Atlantic rainforest, and there are some amazing woodpeckers, tanagers, hummingbirds. It's just a fantastic place to start a trip. We communicated a little bit while you were gone, and I remember you were shooting at a certain lodge, and they had some sort of setups, but you said it was very difficult to get photos there because... It was somewhat set up, but not exactly for photography. Yeah, this was this was the the first location was the classic sort of you go to a place and there's really good birds and they're coming to feeders, but you couldn't set it up worse for photography. I mean, just, you know, <laughs> in the most challenging possible place. The good thing was the birds were coming and they were cooperative. They were They were coming to the food. There was a lot of birds coming in, so I can work with that. But it did take some serious rejigging of things to get the feeders set up in a location where we could take some really stunning shots. So let's say our viewers get to one of these lodges, they're happy for you to sort of rearrange something a little bit. What would be sort of a couple small things that people could do? Long time watchers of the show will know we hate the sun, <laughs> but when it is sunny, you have to work with it. So I was the first sort of 24 hours there, I was really paying attention to light angles and figuring out where things would work. And then essentially what I, tried to do was find areas that would stay sort of shady in the morning and maybe into the afternoon as well. Basically setting up for even yeah. light. That's the main thing. Like if we've got bird and the perches being hit by sun and a sunny background, we can work with that. Even better would be if we have some nice flat light, some even shade on both the subjects and the background. And that's what I tried to find. So that meant totally moving the feeders around, using about a million cable ties, strapping up things everywhere to try to get a good setup going. Well, that looks really awesome. Awesome. One day you definitely have to take me to South America as well. Where did you go after that? I think you said you went to the Pantanal, some completely different habitat. It's a dynamic ecosystem. It's a, it can be very these sort of flooded kind of wetland areas that have dried up at this time of year. But there's also some really interesting forest habitat and, and a real good variety of things to look for. Now that you said it's sort of dried up at this time of year, is this the time of the year to travel to Brazil? There's certain reasons why I plan my trips this time of year, because when we're in the Pantanal, another thing that we're looking for is the elusive jaguar. And this is an excellent time of year to search for those guys, and it's also a good time for the birds. So it's a really perfect kind of hybrid time to do a lot of different things. So is it lodges there as well, or you're on a boat, or you're just trapsing through the through the bush? What's What's it like? We kind of drive in and visit a few different ecosystems on the way down to that river. And we spend five or six days getting down there and then a few days on the river doing jaguars and birds and then we head back. So that all sounds very interesting, but what about those macaws? <laughs> this man loves his parrots. <laughs> so we had a crazy shoot with those guys. There was literally probably 15 to 20 of these massive blue macaws coming down to this super low fruits that were on this palm. It was it was a fantastic shoot for the best opportunity I've ever had for that species. I must say I might be slightly jealous. Another cool bird down there is always all those toucans. Did you have any opportunities with them? They just look amazing with their massive beaks. We we were at the um the lodge and I noticed this big fig tree that had tons of fruits on it. And then, you know, the next afternoon, I was off a little bit away from that area with one of the clients on the trip, and we saw these two to toko toucans fly in, not to that tree, but to another area. And right away, I said to the client, let's go, let's go, let's go, run, follow me. And we ran over because I knew that those birds were headed to that tree. I just knew that they were going to go there to feed as they're flying in that direction. So where we were, if we got them flying out, it would have just been a butt shot of flying away from us. So we ran to get in front of them and intercept them as they could fly then between us and the tree they were going to. And we got some awesome shots of these toko toucans flying right past us, perfect light, flying right into the light angle. And it was all because of that anticipation of knowing what's going to happen and predicting it and getting yourself in the right position, which I think is a really important thing, an important skill to try to develop as a bird photographer. 
Well, that looks like an awesome trip and definitely makes me want to go out there and see some new birds too. Which brings me to our next topic, motivation. So Glenn, what inspires you and keeps you motivated to go out there again and again and again and to travel to all these places? Well, I think that's the, you nailed it right there. It's for me, it's the, a lot of bird photography has become about traveling to these places and to see these new birds and these new ecosystems and just to be out in nature in an exciting and new way. And that's, that's what gets me really motivated as a bird photographer these days. But you already live in an awesome place. I actually traveled to where you live to photograph birds. So how come you're not really doing a lot of photography around your area anymore? Yeah, that's totally true. I live on Vancouver Island, which is a stunning part of the world. It's beautiful here. But here's the reality. I've lived here now for almost 20 years. I've been a bird <laughs> photographer that entire time. And early to mid spring is sort of the sweet spot for most of the birds when they look good and they're in their best plumage and everything's looking great. And I just find there's a certain point where the likelihood of me improving my images of the species that are likely to be found here just just plummets. Because I travel so much through my own personal shoots and the tours that I lead, I kind of get like a lot of bird photography days. I mean, last year I was in the field 200 days traveling. So I'm not really looking to take more pictures once I get home. I need to process them. I need to spend some time with my wife. I need to do some stuff around the house. So it's just sort of my life, the way that it kind of works for me that I don't wind up shooting that much locally. I mean, obviously it's easy to get motivated when you're traveling around the world and you're constantly seeing new species and these just stunning, beautiful birds. But I know, Jan, you've had some health challenges lately and haven't really been able to travel or to go to new areas. So what about you? How have you been able to stay motivated to get out there and still keep capturing great images? It's definitely been a challenge. I actually had to cancel a lot of awesome trips that I had planned. I'm basically bound to my local area. And so I just tried to focus on some new projects that I could do in this area. For instance, there's all these pale-headed rosellas around here. And so I really started to try and built up a portfolio of them. Like there's a tree in my backyard that has these massive red flowers, they feed on those. I set up a little bird feeder in my backyard, so I have different birds coming in. And so just try to stay locally. I'm lucky because there's birds like the pitta pretty close by, so I could photograph some of them. And interestingly, I know not everyone can do that, but doing these gear reviews on YouTube has actually helped me to motivate a lot because it gives me like a new purpose to go out there and photograph birds that I've already photographed because it's a new camera, it's a new lens. So I need to get some good photos with it. And sometimes you just learn about completely new spots that are really nearby as well. Like these ospreys, I suddenly found out on Facebook, there's this cliff where these ospreys fly past all the time. So I went there a few times and got some awesome shots. So you definitely don't always have to travel somewhere far. I think it's easier to stay motivated or get excited when you're traveling, but there's definitely a lot of opportunities in your local area as well. Well, and you also, you do a lot more video than I do. So you've certainly been able to keep that going. Totally. That helps. And another thing I've tried to do is just mix up my style a little bit as well. I've been shooting a lot more wider shots of like the pitta in the forest and the whippet in the forest and just a little bit of a different style. It's obviously hard sometimes because you feel like, oh, I've seen this kookaburra in my backyard the last six weeks every day. So you don't get as excited to photograph it anymore. But then at the same time, there's always new opportunities like the one when I photographed it right into the sun where you just see the silhouette with the outline. So if you actually think of new ways of photographing things, you can definitely just take some awesome photos literally in your backyard or with hardly without leaving your house. Now, I don't know about you, Jan, but one of the things that actually often motivates me is just looking at other really good images online. You know, sometimes on Instagram or something will pop up a species you've always wanted to see or someone's captured a really awesome image and that I get like FOMO and I want to go see that bird. I want to see that, that species. And I, I do find that's a real thing that actually motivates you to get out and want to go shooting is when you see other people taking great images. What about you? Definitely. It's the same for me. And I sometimes, as you say, I see someone on Instagram and I actually go to their website and I see all their awesome photos and I just get, yeah, the motivation and maybe some new ideas or just seeing other people have awesome photos makes me go like, yes, I do need to go out. And I think it also sometimes shows you that you might not have to travel so far because that person took like a really cool shot of a bird from like your area and you go like, yep, I'll definitely want to get something like that myself. For me, one of the things that I did during <laughs> during the pandemic was 
this hummingbirds book. So that gave me something to do during all that downtime. So finding a little a fun little project that has a tangible kind of outcome could be another great way to get motivated. And you know what motivated me lately? I actually gave myself my own little project. It was just looking through a lot of my old photos because I realized when you came to Australia last year I was feeling so sick that I ne never actually deleted any of the photos that we took <laughs> together so I was going through my hard drives I'm like oh there's these massive folders there's like 25,000 photos in these folders so I started to look through those images I'm like wow there's some awesome shots in there I should really start to edit those and then of course I love parrots so I started to look through some of my other older photos from like my Cairns trip for instance and I saw so many photos that I've never edited and now with the new technology, our pro sets, my masterclass workflow, it actually helps you to get so much more out of these older photos sometimes. Like some photos I've taken with a 1D Mark IV or 5D Mark IV and they were okay but now with the new workflow with the better colors we can yeah. get with the pro sets, it just looks so much better and all these okay old photos become like real stunners basically. So this actually it's gotten me a lot of motivation to just go back and revisit some of the photos I've already taken because I think sometimes we're always chasing the next thing, the next colorful bird, the next strip, everything else and we forget about all the things we've already taken and could edit up for instance. So Jan, what did you find going back and looking at some of those older images were some of the things that with the new technology you could really improve upon when you were re-editing or editing those images for the first time? Definitely the noise, the new noise reduction software, whether it's Adobe Enhance or DX or Pure or Autopus D noise, they helped a lot in just getting these images nice and clean. Then obviously enjoyed using our pro sets that just give me a much better starting point than the Adobe profiles. It's just one click and it looks good. But then I still had a lot of challenges, especially with these black cockatoos, because they attract a lot of weird color casts like in their plumage. They look like blue and red and magenta and it's very strange or here's another head portrait of a bird and when a lot of sun shines onto the bird the feathers just sort of reflect it all and the black bird kind of becomes gray so it's important that you learn how to select like the bird in the background individually and then darken areas of the birds I use a lot of curves for that and also like to use selective color to get rid of some of these color casts or you can even just use the hue saturation panel go into like the blue panel and pull the saturation down there to get rid of these funny color cars because I always find if a bird is black for instance it needs to look black or the whole image looks funny to our eyes like if we know this thing should be black but it looks blue you're just thrown off and the whole image doesn't look right. Yeah absolutely there's no question that We've said it once, we'll say it again. You have to learn how to process your images to the best of your ability. It is a, a journey to get there, but you need to invest time in the digital darkroom to, to really make your photos shine. So we have some resources for you down in the description and you can check those out and really take your images to that next level. Speaking of images and editing, let's take a look at some of your images and how you fared this week. Glenn and I went through, I think it's over 25,000 images now on Instagram that are tagged bird photo show and we picked six favorites for this week three by me three by glenn so what's your first one glenn go <laughs> all right so the first image that i brought for us this week is by kenyan birder and it's of this really nice scarlet chested sunbird i think this is a really cool shot i love these sunbirds i've never seen a sunbird actually i have seen some sunbirds in in australia and papua new guinea but i've never seen this one it's got that vertical kind of perch but the birds sort of between these two interesting flowering heads i just think it's a it's a an attractive image and it's it's nicely composed what about you Jan? it's like a really weird pose that somehow still seems to work i guess it's because yeah. that flower looks so cool with these two sort of wobbly balls there flowers coming out yeah. i guess with the sunbirds in an ideal world i probably want more of a head turn but then you probably don't see any of the iridescence on the throat so it's always a challenge yeah. with these birds and all around I think it's a really nice image I wouldn't really change anything and actually we both picked the image from Kenyan Birder this week so we had to remove mine but he must have impressed us a lot this week <laughs> good job Kenyan Birder I'm a little bit into action shots this week so the first one I picked is of this awesome bee eater in flight by Gabby Sandu and it was taken in Romania and I think it's just a perfect banking poles you see all the colors the wings are nicely stretched out it's a decent enough head turn all around it's really really nice the 
only thing I might have tried would be maybe to slightly separate the bird and the background a little bit more. But other than that, I think it looks really nice. So you could have either made the background a little bit brighter or maybe add a little bit of magenta to the bird. It's a great shot, really amazing pose. The only thing that for me is there's sort of the bottom right of the image, the bottom right triangle is that kind of more green. And then you have sort of the background goes on a quite abrupt line to a more yeah. tan and green color. So I think if this was mine, I would have probably tried to smooth that out a little bit to have the background more homogeneous. Um, but overall, an awesome shot by Gabby Sandu. My second photo this week is by Tyler Wenzel Photography. And I just think it's a really cute shot. It's a black crested coquette. I'm guessing this was taken in Costa Rica. And these birds are just so comical. You know, they've got these floopy little feathers coming out of their head and this great looking beard situation going on. And when you get them looking right at the camera, sometimes it's not all birds work well when they're looking right at you, but I think this is a cool mm. one. So um, just a really, a really fun shot by Tyler here. What do you think, Jan? I think it's interesting that this is the second shot this week you pick with like an awkward pose that somehow mm. works. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. weird because it looks like the beak just looks like a red sort of dot. You can't even see that to be, yeah. but it, it, it works quite well. So I think, yeah, it, it's just an interesting photo that was definitely nicely done. When you have a species that's so cool, you can get away with stuff that you wouldn't yeah. be able to get away with otherwise. So, for example, if this was a house sparrow, probably doesn't work. Yeah. All right, my second shot this week is of this awesome house martin in flight. Another great banking pose. I'm not entirely sure if this is a sky background or possibly a water background. I'd almost be more tempted to say it's a water background just by the depth so. of it. And swallows often fly quite low, so I guess it might might be that. But yeah, I think it's just a fantastic shot, a great pose, a great head turn. And I just like all the colors and everything else about it. Maybe I would remove a little bit of whatever is on the, the top wing that kind of makes me stare at it. And... There might be a couple spot in the blue feathers that I might be tempted to remove as well. And I think looking at your face, you might feel the same, Glenn. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you didn't say that, I was going to say it. There's that little bit of probably cobweb or something that's on the upper wing. But you cannot get a better pose than this for a swallow or a martin. That is just the perfect pose. And yeah, I totally agree. I would just do a little bit of cleanup on that back. There's that kind of one little white area. Yeah. And... After that, it's a stunner, so great job. My third and final image this week is by Leslie P. Wild Photography, and it's of a really cool barred owl, and you can kind of tell that it's in the Pacific Northwest rainforest, and it's kind of coming down. The, I really like this shot. I like the mood of it. I like the, the habitat inclusion. The only thing I'm not crazy about... Actually, let's play the game. Jan, what do you think that I'm not totally excited about when it comes to this shot? Usually I can pick what you're thinking right away. This time I'm not entirely sure because I'm still kind of struggling myself with how I feel about the image. I think, as you say, it's a really nice pose. For me, the background might be slightly almost too much in focus. Like that branch right behind it where it likely took off from is quite sort of obvious still. So I don't know if that's what you're thinking, but that's probably the one thing I keep looking at because it's right behind the bird. So it's definitely drawing my eye in. Well, I wasn't actually thinking that, but for me, this image, and I'm not even sure, it's it gets into that gray area of like rolling shutter wing blur. Yeah. Where I'm kind of, I'm looking at this image and I'm thinking, is that reality of how the bird's wings are or is that rolling shutter? Mm. And I think we're seeing a lot more of this in images all over Instagram and the internet where even even contest winning shots, great shots that have been deemed to be great winning shots that have crazy rolling shutter. Yeah. For me, it kills the shot. If, if you can tell that it's not a real wing pose or the bird's wing looks streaked or too long or yeah. strange looking. Now this one is, is very marginal, but I think that's one thing when I see this image, I'm like, is it rolling shutter or, or not? So something to think about. I think in this case, it definitely looks like the wings are a little bit too large. But for instance, yeah. it would be quite easy in this case to use the liquify tool in Photoshop mm. 
to actually correct this a little bit. This doesn't always work with the rolling shutter, but I think here would actually work quite well. Overall, I think, yeah, it's a great image, but there's definitely some things to think about. Yeah, and you had a good video recently talking about the R7 and ways to kind of control rolling shutter. And I just think with the mirrorless cameras now, you have to know your camera and think about the speed of the bird and what is exactly the subject, because you might be able to get away with electronic shutter on a certain camera yeah. or with the same camera on a slower flying bird. But then all of a sudden, something like a hummingbird or a bird that's really launching off of a perch, you'll get these bizarre effects. And while it's tempting to get that frame rate, it's not worth it if most of the shots have crazy rolling shutter, from, from, from my money anyways. And here's the thing with rolling shutter as well. If you are hand holding, you're panning with the bird, you'll really have minimal rolling shutter. Rolling shutter is by far the worst, even at crazy high shutter speeds. If you are on a tripod or your camera is stationary, and then the bird flies through the wing, or like in this case, the bird's taking off suddenly. That's usually when you get by far the most rolling shutter. Whereas if you're hand holding, very minimal, but on a tripod or the bird taking off, that's when you usually get the worst. The last image I picked is of this awesome Indian gray hornbill with the beak open. I just love the pose. I like the background. I love the red eye of the bird, but there's probably one thing I would change, Glenn. What do you think that is? I guess I'm just going to say what I would do. For me, the bird is too close to the right edge of the frame. So I would, I would have composed this image differently for the gram. I would have moved the bird back in the frame a bit. And I'm not even sure that it needs to be so long of a crop. I don't know that you need that much space above. And I would be tempted to crop it right where the sort of the breast or the neck kind of curves in and move the bird up and to the left in the frame. Now, it looks like this was shot in really warm, uh, low angle sunlight, morning or afternoon, which you either love or you find to be too warm. Um, and I don't mind it here, but I'm wondering if maybe that's where you're going. As if you know me and you know my images, you know I'm not a lover of warm sunlight. So I definitely would have pulled back the sort of warmth and yellows in this one, especially because it's called like a grey hornbill, I guess, and it kind of pushes a lot into the brown. And as you say, you could either crop it differently or I would have probably also worked on that weird shadowy area at the bottom there. It's like the legs and the yeah. belly a little bit. And what you could do there is an interesting trick. Sometimes if you have a weird shadow, you can't get rid of it. You can use like the clone stamp 40 to 50% opacity and just go over the shadows and we'll just make it look like the shadow isn't really there and it's much lighter. So that's something you could have definitely done here to even it out a little bit because it just looks slightly odd. But overall, I think a really nice image. It's definitely a cool portrait. I mean, I think when it comes to an image like this, you want to highlight the thing that's the most interesting and you want to get rid of everything else. So that's why I say a yep. tighter crop and moving the bird up would make an overall stronger image in my opinion. And on that note, it's time to wrap up this week's episode of the Bird Photography Show. Thanks so much for watching guys. So be sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and if you want to take your image editing to the next level, make sure you check out our pro sets, Jan's masterclass, and my eBooks down in the description. And we will see you guys in the next episode. And don't forget to subscribe. Bye. We'll see you next time.